Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Woodworking Wisdom here at Axminster Tools. Um, we're in our crafty workshop again today, and we are going to go through um, a, a little pierced project. Um, and it kind of forms like a little ball, um, and there's lots of different things you could do with it. Um, today, I'm doing it like a light shade. Um, I'm going to put a string of lights in there. Um, but we'll show you how you could kind of um, change it into different projects. You could um, make it bigger on, on its scale, um, have it as a light shade or a lamp shade, bedside table. But it's basically just a bunch of panels that we're going to cut and kind of stick them all together. And it looks very kind of angular, almost like a, um, a football, if you will. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. We're making a, a little light shade and I'm going to take you through it step by step. Um, a little bit different the way we're kind of joining this together. Um, I kind of had to come up with some a, a way of joining it. But again, we're going to talk about a few different ways that you could um, you could join this thing together. Um, I've come up with a really simple, um, easy idea. Um, because that's what I could try and try and do a lot is um, is make things accessible and um, make them easy and, and with things that you might have um, at home. Now, we're going to start off by cutting our first um, pentagon. So we're going with a pentagon. This will work with other shapes um, with different, you know, different amounts of sides. Um, we've got a five sided pentagon here um, and we're going to just go through the steps of how we cut it. And then we've got a pretty much almost made um, project which we're going to join it to. But the, um, the, the steps for all those other panels are exactly the same. And you don't have to follow this, um, this design. Um, you could do it however you want. So let's go over to the bench here. Um, as always, sorry, let's come, sorry, let's come back onto camera one. As always, we've got Steph on cameras and, and questions. Um, any questions you have, please pop them in the comments. Um, they really help us out, help us along the, um, with the demonstration. Um, so that's it. We'll go on to our, our bench here. So what I've done is I've cut these out. I've pre-cut a, a couple of these little pentagons. And I've just come up with a pattern, um, which is basically a, a whole bunch of pentagons put um, sort of downsized and put on edge. And the way I did that was just measure between here and here, make a mark, do the same on all five sides, and then just draw in those lines to, to make the mark. And then you've got another shape internally, and we do the same again. So measure that midway point. And um, I've just put some offset um, pentagons against each other. And we're going to cut out a few of these little windows um, and allow that light to kind of shine through it. Now, I've glued the template on. Um, I saved you the, um, you know, if you've seen these demos, demos before, I like to use this Copydex um, glue, but you could. Um, stick that template down however you want, whether it's uh, mask and tape and print stick. Um, I just prefer the quick use of the of the copy decks. What I am doing though is just punching a hole with a little brattle um, to punch it through that glue layer, um, and then it doesn't bind up on the drill as much. Sometimes with this silicon glue or rubber glue, it can kind of bind up on the drill bit. So I just like to punch through that little layer of glue and hopefully our drill bit will, um, won't pick up on it as much. So goggles on when I'm drilling and we just need to go through this um, little layer. I always like to have a little peek, make sure we've gone through. I'm using a board underneath. I don't want to drill into my bench. Um, that just saves the, saves the bench, really. It's easy to drill on the wrong place on here. So what I've done is I've gone around with a pencil and just marked the windows um, that I want to um, take out. I did one earlier. I was on autopilot and I drilled into one of the other windows. And then, of course, you can't use that piece. So a little bit of breakout on the back here. Um, I'll just get a little bit of abrasive, get rid of the worst of that. 
so it's not rocking on the table of the scroll saw once we get going. So that's good. Um, that's ready to go onto the saw. All right. So fairly straightforward, nice and easy little project, this one. You can see we've drilled right the way through. Um, we've got almost a little star pattern already for those. And you could do that. You could just do lots of a series of drill holes and make it, um, you know, like one of those kind of perforated um, things you see in the Turkish restaurants and things. Um, so you could do lots of little piercing, um, lots of little drill holes, um, or you could just open these out, make them a bit more angular. Loads of stuff you could do with this project. Um, we're keeping it simple to keep it within the hour today. Um, but like I say, have an experiment. Try some different um, different things. So camera three onto the uh, scroll saw here. Okay. So this is a pierce project. So we're going to thread our blade through these, um, these holes that we've drilled, bring our arm back down and just grab onto that blade. Nice and quick and easy on this machine. It's just pulled up from the bottom. We're good. Um, hooked up to auto extraction. Um, we should be good to go. And the way I'm going to start this, I'm going to just cut down into along this line, then back up and cut like a little teardrop shape. So we're coming over to this line now. And it should, if you get it right, the blade should just pick that out and throw it up onto the, um, onto the project. Sometimes they do drop through into the extraction plate. And all you'd have to do is just pick that up and get it out from underneath. Because sometimes it will catch on there and it will kind of pivot on those points. So resting the blade on this side of the um, of that line now and just following that up, pick up where that um, other cut finished. We can do the same the other side. And I'm just coming to that corner and instead of trying to um, spin the project round and potentially giving myself a little round in there, I'm just reversing up the cut a little and then we're going to cut into here and just leave that little corner Oops. leave that little corner there and then we'll come up to meet that cut which will move that piece I tend to have a little pair of um, long nose pliers around in case we need to remove anything that's getting in our way and then we can come back up here and make that cut let me just pull that out of the way and then we can answer some questions um, now I don't know if you can see it really on camera there. Let's bring it up nice and close. Oh, it doesn't want to focus. But you can see here we've got really sharp, defined corners. Okay. All right, then. So we've got a first question, Steph. Yeah, so we've got one person's asked, what is the size of one length side of the pentagon? So um, yeah, so it doesn't really matter um, as long as they're all the same. Um, I think on this one it was about 49. Let me just have a little measure up. Not with a metre rule. Let's get us something smaller. So these were about 58 mil. Okay. So, um, yeah, it, but really I was working to the size of the piece of timber I had. Um, you know, quite often we get asked what sizes um, the things that we we're um, we're working with, and quite often the answer is, um, you know, the, we're we're kind of using the size of timber that we've already got. So the piece that I had would have been that kind of probably sixty mil um, in width. So I've used um, I've 
use the photocopier to bring that sizing up, or you can do it on the on the computer. Um, size things for printing out, and um, and made it fit our piece of wood. So I haven't um, designed it around that fifty eight mil. That was just a coincidence from the from the blank that we had. All right. Perfect. And a question from the same person, Cliff. He said, "Would it be better to mark or shade in the areas to be cut first? Uh huh. So I did do that, Cliff. I've put a little um, a little pencil mark on all the um, the bits that I was. Sorry, if we come back onto camera two here, I put a little pencil mark, a little squiggle on each of these apertures that we're going to cut out. Um, and then I drilled them um, and we're only going to cut out those areas that have got that drill hole in and they're quite clearly uh, marked on our template. Um, so hopefully we won't have any um, any problems with that. OK, brilliant. And we've got a question here from Ed. Do cool. you normally cut? Sorry, do you normally cut directly on the line or slightly on the waist side? I cut. I tend to cut slightly on the waist side, and then if we've got any cleanup to do, if we want to get in there with any little files or anything, um, we can do that. We've got the space to do it. Um, and also, if you kind of overshoot something, just ever so slightly in the corner, if you kind of just overshoot it by a millimeter or two, you've got that little bit of extra space, little bit of wiggle room to then bring the other um, edge in, um, so that they both meet on that on that angle. So I tend to cut slightly on the waist side. Um, and with something like this, so I'm not going for like ultra precision. It's a kind of a crafty, um, you know, homemade type of thing. Um, so I'm not going for ultra precision. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to st stick on the, the waist side of the cut. All right. Perfect. That's everything for the moment. Cool. Thanks, Steph. So we're just going to go through the motions. We're going to cut these little triangles out. Now these, um, I don't know if we can quite see, these two triangles are connected by a little bit here. So in theory, you could cut right through there. But as I've been doing a few of these, I found that um, as we exited through here into this void that we were gonna cut, um, we get a little bit of breakout. So I've just gone back to cutting them each individually. So we're doing the same sort of thing. We're going to cut, we're going to pick up on that straight line, reverse back up into our um, drill hole, and then come on the other line. It's going to come up and meet it in that corner. Again, just use the blade to try and pick that out. And sometimes it will drop down into that extraction plate, which is just done. Rotate the workpiece on the back of the blade. It's not cutting anything there. I can put my finger on the back there and it's not going to cut it. So I'm resting the blade as I rotate this, and that's not going to mark any of those internal faces then. So again, just cutting into that line, picking up on that straight, and then just getting rid of that little pit just lift it out and then we need to bring it back here rotate on the back of the blade and then bring that cut in there and again that should just pip out if you're into piercing or pierce work you know the amount of times you have to release the blade pop it back in Um, it's, it's good practice for, um, for blade changing and things like that. So again, we've cut that bit. I saw it move. So we can use the blade to kind of lift that out. Rotating on the back of the blade. We can make our cut here, resting on the side of the blade until it picks up. And then we're going to rotate that way. 
Let's have this one. And with this, when it's repetitive like this, you tend to get in a bit of a rhythm of how you're going to cut these things. And the game I play is whether I can get the blade back in to that hole before the auto extraction turns itself off. So I'm racing the, um, the extractor. There we go. So again, use that blade to just pick up and fling that little chip out. And then up to there. And there. I'm going to pick up on that line. So that one is kind of caught in the way. I don't want that to um, foul on the blade and perhaps get dragged back in and snap something. So just removing that one. Get that little chip out again. So these long nose pliers, little jeweler's pliers, they come in really useful if you're doing lots of stuff like this. Oh, the tractor beat me that time. Sorry, Sorry, Steph. I can't, can't quite hear you. <laughs> that will turn itself off in just a moment. If we come back onto camera one. Yeah, no worries. So, what size blade are you using? I always, I always go for the same blade. This is uh, my old trusty. This is a modified geometry number five. Really good for cutting um, outside shapes. Um, again, I'm not cutting puzzle pieces that need to kind of mesh together, so I can go with a slightly bigger blade. Um, and those number fives got a little bit more thickness, a little bit more strength, and they'll take a little bit more of a, um, a little bit more of a battering. If your feed rate goes up a bit, if you have a little catch or something like that, it's a, just got a little bit more strength. Um, if you want to cut things really intricate, drop down to threes or even the ones and zeros, um, especially your, you know, your kind of puzzle pieces, you might want to drop down so they get that really nice kind of uh, mesh. Um, but this number five, it, it, I've, you know, I've used it so much. I use it all the time. Um, it's a real, real favorite of mine. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, I thought you'd be able to hear me over the extractor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Frederick's asked, what is it tulip wood that you're using? Hi, Frederick. Yep, tulip. Um, again, something that we got lots of in the workshop. Um, lots of little bits for this one. It actually takes up more timber than, than you kind of think. Um, once you start putting all those pieces together, um, so something nice and cheap, um, quite thick. I think if I was to do this again, I would probably um, have a slightly thinner material, but I was a little bit worried, and you'll see in a moment, um, how it was going to kind of come together and how it's kind of structural strength was. So I went a little bit thicker for this one, um, but if I was to do it again, I'm happy with how it kind of comes together now. Um, I would definitely do it a little bit um, thinner material. I think we're on about sort of five or six mil here, um, and I'd probably halve that. All right, good. So this camera three. So just whizzing through these now, halfway. 
Oh, my little chips just in the way there, stopping the project from seating nicely on the table. That's really important. Again, I'm going to stop that. This is um, normally I'd probably just blast on and carry on cutting, um, and, and hopefully that chip would move its way out of the way. But sometimes that little chip will pick up on the blade and get driven back down towards the project, and that can sort of snap things, or uh, you know, potentially the blade or the, the project itself. So again, rotating on the back of that blade or resting on it to um, rotate the project. Okay. So you can see what we're doing. We're cutting this almost like a teardrop shape, picking up on those straight lines um, that then kind of intersect on the corner. And then turning the project round so we can pick up on those straight lines by resting on the side of the blade there. And then just continuing that cut. If you need to revisit it, you can just skim along, get that line nice and straight And you can see how quick the, um, you know, releasing that blade and putting the tension back on is on this machine. Really nice, kind of user friendly. Okay, kit. So that's just grabbed and pulled down there. And if I just show you where it sat, I don't know if you can see that in the um, extraction plate. Sometimes, if you're moving your project across like this, it's going to get stuck on there, and that will become the pivot point, and actually can make you cut into your project where you don't want to cut into it. It can almost, um, if you're feeding it onto the cut, and, and the edge of this picks up on that little chip underneath, it can start turning the project. And um, so always fish them out if they go in underneath. So again, rotating on the back of the blade. And we got two more to cut. And we're good. I had drawn another little shape in the middle, another little pentagon. But actually, I'm not using that because I felt um, it was letting too much light through. So we're closing down the amount of light that's going to come through this. And that gives it that kind of more of a glowing look rather than um, 
you know, trying to light a room or something like that. So forcing that little chip onto the teeth and that just pings it out of the way. Again, don't be tempted to put your fingers too close to the saw blade. Obviously, it has got teeth and it does cut. So this was the bit where I said you could carry on that line and start cutting into this piece. But like I said before, I found it would get like a really... Um, not very nice breakout area there so I've, I've gone back to cutting them individually And that's a really important technique, that kind of um, resting on the blade. It doesn't mark the, the workpiece at all. And the kind of clean cut you get off of these um, modified geometry blades. Um, You want to keep that surface nice. You don't want the, um, you know, if you were to swing that around and the teeth of the blade caught the inside face here, it would definitely mark it. You'd get little score lines and things like that. But that's it, really. I actually cut this shape on the bandsaw. And you can see there's a fluff there. But actually, for breakout, this, um, this blade has done a really nice job. There's hardly anything there. You can see the kind of fluffiness um, that you get off the bandsaw um, compared to um, that clean cut we've got on the on the scroll saw. I've just got a little bit in there which I think I'm going to revisit quickly and then we'll get onto the bench and put this together. Okay, good stuff. I'm just going to turn that extractor off. Cool, so some more questions. We have indeed. Uh, we've got a question here from Frederick. It says, I noticed that you don't lower the forks to stop the project jumping up and catching. Is there a reason why you don't? Yeah, they're, they're lowered. Um, so if we come back onto our... Um, project here. Oh, sorry, onto the scroll saw. Um, those forks have come right down. Um, they're just hovering just above the project, and we just need enough um, room to be able to swing that right the way around. Um, but they're down nice and low. Um, if what they're for is if that picks up, it's going to lift up and hit these forks, and it's going to release the blade, um, so it doesn't do that. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, this, this kind of um, guarding and hold down clamp um, should be, you know, just above the workpiece, really. Um, what probably is, let's come on back onto camera one, is when we, on, on this um, scroll saw, we lift the whole arm out the way, okay? Whereas um, when you have your um, one with a fixed arm, you would, between each kind of... Um, cut you would have to lift that arm to be able to get that project in underneath and get that hole threaded on um, but with this um, the whole arm lifts out of the way 
with the um, uh, that hold down clamp in place. And as soon as we drop that back down, that hold down clamp should be back in position. All right. Okay, so another question. Yeah, we've got another question here from Fuller. Have you done this in a brass or an aluminium, say one to two mil thick? No, I've not. I really want to start cutting metal. Um, we've had some really nice projects uh, as well, some some photos of some nice projects and actually a handmade um, project what the, one of our regulars, Martin, um, sent in. And uh, it's really got me thinking about metal, um, about cutting it on the scroll saw. Um, if you're if you're cutting metals on a scroll saw, we need to up the amount of teeth. So this this um, modified geometry blade it, it would have two little teeth on it, um, so we need to up the amount of teeth, um, and um, it, that just cuts a little bit better then because the the tooth isn't coming down on that hard metal. Um, you've got lots of little teeth, kind of almost nibbling away at it. Um, but no, I think a metal one would look really cool actually. Um, so yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Going to get some um, some copper sheets, some aluminium. Um, and we'll we'll have a play with that at some point. Um, but I need some practice first before I can show you guys. <laughs> okay, so um, let's take our little project bit that we've just cut. Is that all right for questions, Steph? That's everything for now, yeah. Great, thank, thank you. you. So, um, thing I like about this copy dex glue is you can kind of roll the whole project off. There's no kind of mucky sticky residue um, it just kind of peels off really nicely so just running my thumb over there sometimes it wants to grab on where we've got a little overhang so let's roll that little overhang up and then we can go back to whizzing it off But if this was your um, your um, tape, same sort of thing. We we'll just bring that off. I just find that the some of the masking tapes leave a little um, kind of tackiness onto the timber. And then if we want to then oil on top, that kind of tacky um, adhesive um, stops the oil from really kind of. Um, you know sinking in okay so <clears throat> what we've got here oh i didn't upload those photos did i onto the thing no sorry so what we did with this one um i've cut a bunch of these and i have literally laid them out like a solid one in the center and then five of these all around the edge Okay, we put a bit of masking tape just to bridge the gap and hold the thing into shape um, before we do our little um, kind of gluing gluing up stage. Um, so the top and bottom of this is, is solid. So we've got a solid um, shape in the middle. And then all these little windows on the side is where the light's going to kind of come out of. So let me get a bit of masking tape. This is the frog tape. This is a really nice one. This doesn't leave a very sticky residue, but a little bit pricey if you're looking at uh, masking tapes, but really good for like um, airbrushing, painters, all that sort of stuff. So I'm putting this up flush to our, um, our bigger project. Let me get this a bit more central. Sorry, folks. I put this up flush so those two flats are touching one another we don't want too much of a gap between um, so bring it in close put your bit of tape on there and then I'm going to put a bit on this side and just kind of let it sit back a bit and a bit on this side now because of the kind of angles of these shapes when you sit them all side by side like this, they should all come up to meet one another and almost form like a little bowl, a little bowl shape. And we're not sticking this with um, masking tape, don't worry. We have got a, 
a, a different way of um, holding this together. But this really is so it sort of sits in its shape. You can manipulate it now and um, and get all your kind of glue and bits ready. Um, but that sits quite comfortably like that. Um, I was um, I did have it in a bowl and it was really fiddly to get inside there. But actually, once you've got all that tape on there, all those little bits of tape kind of add up and give you a fairly strong structure. Now, if we've turned that over, um, you can see the beginnings of, of what we're trying to do. This is the one that we've just cut. So, you know, with a little bit of wiggling, getting that into position, we want to close these gaps as much as we can. Obviously, it doesn't really matter if we've got gaps down the side here, it's just going to look cool with all the lights sort of pouring out of it. If you wanted to do this um, differently, you could set the angle on a, on a sanding table on your sanding disc so that um, you could kick the table over like that and then sand off that edge and then the, the bits will come up flush. Okay, so they could all come up flush together. Um, the way I've done it, you know, that is really quite a precise thing um, and it, you know my fear is that it wouldn't work on the live um, so I've gone back to a slightly more basic way of, of, of doing this and that is just to get those um, get all that mask and tape in position um, it forms its own kind of shape once all these edges of, of um, are, are aligned and then we can just stick in bits of dowel okay so I've just put a bit of glue on a bit of three mil dowel that's uh, 40 mil long and literally just getting um, this is type one so a, a decent PVA and just put in a bit there and then a little bit leave a little gap and then another line there okay and then we can just pop that into position on that top edge. I tend to kind of poke it in a little bit and we get ever such ever so slightly a bit of overspill on the glue. Um, but actually as it dries, the, the color of it changes and any real kind of excess, grab a bit of um, blue roll. We can just get a little corner of our blue roll and just get that big bit that's gonna kind of show off um, that glue mark. So we can have a little tidy up and get rid of the worst of the kind of gluey bits. Again, that will resist an oil. Um, if you wanted to put a, like a finish or a color or paint on top of this, um, you know, we don't want that um, glue to be interfering with it. But don't be stingy with the glue. We want to, you know, it, it's definitely got to hold on two faces. So what we're doing is making sure there's um, enough glue down each side for it to stick in, in both places. And the tackiness of the glue is enough to hold this in place. So sometimes I use another little stick as like um, as a kind of um, tool just to help hold it in place. Okay. And then we've got one more. Put a bit too much on that one. So I'm just gonna use my little stick to spread that around that side. So we've had Fuller on doing a bit of mathematics for you, Ben. Oh, good man. So he said, if that's a dodecahedron and you wish to have mitered corners, then the pentagons should have a dodecahedral uh, angle. Sorry, I probably said that horrifically <laughs> wrong. <laughs> you it. A dehedral angle of 116.6 degrees. Okay. So that's quite some math. Yeah, I, I know I was saying to Steph about this last night. If I had just Googled this shape and then, um, you know, we would probably be able to get that angle bang on on the sanding table. We could set it on the sanding table and we could bring each one of these 
I'm just going to bring that to one side a minute. If you imagine my hands are kind of sanding table, we're kicking it off at that angle, and then we're bringing that up to the, the, the disc. As long as we leave this top line on, so we can sand off this bit that kind of protrudes, um, then we can take it right up to this line. And in theory, they should go together perfectly. Um, so you would lose, you know, you wouldn't have to bother with these dowel things. Um, and they would come up and it would be, you know, you'd just get a really nice little seam along each of these. Um, quite a difficult thing to hold um, when gluing. You'd probably have to bring in some sort of um, mold or a bowl or something. Do one angle at a time. <laughs> Do one at a time, yeah. <laughs> but knowing my luck, I would, um, something would go run afoul. So I tried to make this a little bit more simple. And I quite like the look of it, actually. I quite like the um, the dowels, um, that kind of, and the hard edges of the um, pentagons. I think it looks quite cool. And you could color those to effect. You could put a little stain on them, um, you know, really make them um, look a little bit different. So there we go. We've got the kind of, um, that could be, you know, it could be a bowl. It could be um, a lampshade. Um, you know, obviously we want to bring that up. We were talking earlier and we were saying, um, you know, if you wanted to uh, make this bigger, um, you could get a light fitting, take off one of these, you know, cut a hole in the top here and drop that fitting through. Uh, it kind of reminds me of those old lamps that you get when you have the... Um, you know, where they drill holes down in here and have strings of, of beads and stuff hanging off them. Um, you know, one of those old kind of uh, retro lamps. Um, but here we've done it almost like a night light. Um, so it's billed as a, um, a lampshade, but really I would call this a light shade because um, we're, we're not attaching it to a lamp or anything. So in true Blue Peter fashion, We've got another one here that we made earlier. Um, Steph, in a minute, is going to do the great honours of, of turning the lights off like it's someone's birthday. Um, but we've got... That's our kind of basic project. And like I say, you could do any sort of patterns. You could do um, leaves and ferns running through this. Um, you know, I always like a good dinosaur, so you could have dinosaurs. And then that's going to throw shadows of dinosaurs you know, around the room, really kind of cool. Probably a little bit scary, but we don't mind. Make a good nightlight. For yeah, any exactly. Young children and grandchildren, any young little children that you, you may have or know. Yeah. To uh... yeah, make a really nice little um, nightlight. And again, I would probably glue some dowels um, in these areas and keep it this like a lid, so it's like two halves. Okay, so that can come off and on. Um, and you can see already, I've already just glued that, but, um, you know, it's a fairly strong structure. It reminds me a little bit of, um, oh, what's that film with the man with the pins in his head? Hellraiser. <laughs> I'd say a bit of okay. Hellraiser <laughs> a bit before your time, Steph. Okay, so we're going to turn off the lights, have a little look-see at what this, um, what this looks uh, with the lights off. So quite a cool little thing, uh, not too fussy. You can see where we've got the gaps, where the, the join isn't quite perfect, but I like all that. Um, and this kind of looks like a bit like a football as well. You could put your favourite, um, you know, football team emblems on there. You could have the, um, yeah, like your Man U or whatever it is Reminds uh, me you're into. <laughs> yeah, sure right. Why, but it Something off the... Um... So, yeah, quite a nice little project. All right. And really easy to make, really simple um, thing. A great little gift. And, you know, it does look a little bit um, fragile. But, you know, I dropped this earlier. And it didn't fall apart. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's fairly st structurally strong because um, we've got all those faces glued together. Individually, those joins would be uh, not strong at all. 
Um, but when they kind of come together and all support each other, we've got quite a strong little um, little thing there. All right. So that's our um, that's our light shade, our scroll saw light shade. Um, like I say, really easy to put together. Um, I thought yesterday I might need an extra pair of hands, but actually when you lay it out, um, it, it's a really easy thing to, um, to, to bring up each individual um, pentagon and, um, and glue them and, and, and fix them with that tape. And that tape comes off really easy. Once, that's, once that glue's set, I'll remove all that tape um, and probably have a little sand around any little areas that, um, you know, there might be a little bit of a um, little bit of breakout or something like that. Get in there with a file or, or um, an abrasive and just tidy that up all around um, and make it a really nice little object. That's it, really. Any more questions, Steph? Are we good? Uh, no, we're good. We're good. Just some people saying nice projects, very Halloween. Yeah, it is a little bit Halloween. Again, you could make it pumpkin. You could have witches and things, whatever you're into. Oh, I like um, pumpkin <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, um, you know, make it your own. You can cut whatever shapes you want into those. And there are other shapes that will work with each other um, to create even different, you know, shapes. I've seen one online where, um, where they've put triangle shapes on top. So it comes up more of a point. Um, but you know, have an experiment. Um, quite often I will, um, let me just show you this actually before we sign off. Before we cut it out on something like that, because it takes a whole bunch of wood, um, I quite often make something in kind of cardboard to make sure um, that things are going to work, that they're going to kind of um, go together, that the angles will work with one another. Um, so I made that in cardboard first and I was I was fairly confident it was it was going to go together as a as a wooden project, but you know, try it out, have a go, um, um, and before you use your wood, just try it in paper, card, that sort of thing. Um, so that's it, really. Um, another woodworking wisdom. Um, if you've enjoyed the video, uh, please give us a like and a, a, a thumbs up and subscribe. Um, back tomorrow with with Jason. Um, and We'll see you again soon. Thank you very much.